Shalom, shalom, everybody. This one's going to be a different segment. It ties into the Torah portion of Yithro and the establishment of government. I myself am a criminologist and I study criminology at the University of New Mexico and Central New Mexico universities. I am going to go and lay out uh, from, a, from the criminological perspective uh, the establishment of the code, the law, and criminal code. I'm going to open up with a word of prayer. Yahweh, I come before you, and I ask that you use me to guide me and to be your mouthpiece, Father, to establish and to teach what you have your your sheep to learn today. I ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. I'm going to go over what criminology is. Criminology, the scientific discipline of the study of crime, violations of criminal law, criminal behavior. This comes from the psychological aspect, the sociological aspect, neuropsychology, consisting also of the social reaction to criminal activity. Uh, we're going to define some terms now. Norms reflect the values of a given culture by its members. Some are regarded as more important than others. Folkways, the least serious norms, and refer to usages, traditions, customs, niceties that are preferred but not subject to serious sanctions, manners, etiquette, dress, and style. Uh, right now, in the United States and all throughout the world, these norms are being changed and challenged and uh, the folk ways are going to be changed also with our dress styles and etiquette and manners and uh, different sanctions. Uh, mores referred to more serious customs that are that involve moral judgments as well as sanctions either rewards or punishments such as prohibitions against behaviors that are felt to be serious threatening to a group's way of life. So right now, we're seeing a change in that also with our mask mandate and everything like that. Whether you're for it or against it, it doesn't matter. It's affecting our society. It's affecting our norms. It's affecting our folkways. And now it's going to actually start affecting our laws. Laws represent formal mo modes of control, codified rules of behavior, which represent the institutionalization and crystallization of the society's mores. Now the mores again refer to more serious customs that involve moral judgments as well as sanctions, rewards or punishments such as prohibitions against behaviors that are felt to be seriously threatening to a group's way of life. So folkways, mores and laws. So the norms reflect the values of a given culture by its members. Some are regarded as more important than others. Folkways, the least serious norms, and refer to usages, traditions, customs, niceties that are preferred, but not subject to serious sanctions, manners, etiquette, and dress styles. Mores, and then laws. Laws represent the formal modes of control, codified rulers, Codified rules of behavior, which represent the institutionalization and crystallization of the mores. Now I'm going to go into moral absolutism. Moral absolutism. Yahweh, yod heh vav -He, Elohim of Israel, gave mankind the Ten Commandments, which established a nation to be set apart from all nations, to be the light unto the world. As Adonai taught the nations of Israel how to have moral fiber how to honor and serve the Creator, the Designer of the Universe, and how to treat one another. This was all established, like I was saying in the other Torah portion, in Exodus 18, Yitro. Uh, Exodus uh, goes into detail about uh, government and hierarchy. And if you haven't seen that other video, go to Yitro, Torah portion, and it'll ex elaborate more. So from Exodus 18, government and hierarchy and it also established the the bait 
din or the house of judgment uh, as seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 which would be considered the Jewish court which eventually paved the way for our local metropolitan and district courts as well as our supreme courts all mankind is to live according to Torah and the gospel and if one does not obey Torah and the gospel they are deviant to the word of Yahweh which is Yeshua and Yeshua taught his disciples which are the Talmudim and the apostles Torah and gospel and the great commandment and the greatest of the commandment is this love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart with all your might and with all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself the whole Torah the law and the prophets are summed up into this so that's moral absolutism it basically means that there is a moral objective reality that we live in and to back that up there are cultural universals uh, practice practices and customs that in general exist in all known cultures and societies all cultures have been studied and look dimly upon these main things right here lying cheating stealing murder adultery uh, society's protective values by creating norms which are basic rules and modes of conduct so most societies that have been studied by sociologists um, they all have those core tenets in, in common which was given to uh, mankind by Yahweh <clears throat> by the Ten Commandments which is moral fiber moral objective reality <clears throat> Then we get into social deviance. Social deviance is deviant behavior, which refers to a broad range of activities that the majority in society may view as eccentric, dangerous, annoying, bizarre, outlandish, gross, ab abhorrent, insulting, causing of offense. Such behavior is outside the range of normal societal toleration. Then you have relative deviance. Definitions are relative to the time, place, persons making the evaluation, and some act, some acts are more universally defined than others. This goes into moral relativism, which is what they're trying to explain there. Delinquent subcultures. Now here's where we get into the meat and potatoes of why does criminology happen? Why does crime happen? Well, we know that from scripture. The heart is man, the heart of man is desperately wicked, and we know that we have been tempted by Hasatan, and we fell from grace, and ever since then, Yahweh had to make atonement for us to be uh, set apart and be able to get back to him, and that happened through Yeshua HaMashiach as our Passover lamb, and he forgave us of our sins. And we got to have communion with him. And we are in back. We're able to have communion and reconciliation with Adonai. With yod heh vav -Heh, Yahweh the Father. Delinquent subcultures. These delinquent subcultures emerge from society. There's three. Criminal, conflict, and retreatists. The criminal occurs from the stable slum neighborhoods in which hierarchy of available criminal opportunity exists, such as theft, extortion, violence, all of these equal success and money. Uh, conflict occurs in disorganized neighborhood slums and denied. They are den they are denied opportunities for criminal opportunity to achieve success. Thus, resort to violence or reputation. Uh, they get status for conducting in, in this activity. And then there's the retreatists. The retreatists are people which are double failures. Uh, ex they're unable to exceed. They're unable to succeed with uh, legitimate or illegitimate opportunity structures. Thus, they reject the means and the goal. And they drop out from society and seek pleasure and reward. Uh, for drug abuse and dopamine. This was from a study from Cloward and Ohlin's Differential Opportunity Theory from 1960. 
Then we get to the Bergeris concentricized zone theory. Now just think of a circle and then a circle on top of that and then a circle, five of them. The center being the central business center, the poorest. Now in a society, uh, especially this, this was a study that happened in Chicago. If you see a circle, like think of this right here, this is a circle and then in the in the center center that's where the business of the heart is, uh, the business of the the main businesses are that's where uh, the apartment complexes are and most of the laborers go to that to there to work they live in the second circle in the transportation zone uh, this is the highest rates of criminal activity and recidivism uh, recidivism means repeat offending um, in the tra you know in the second zone that's where all the criminal activities happening closest to the nucleus to the center the third uh, center and the more outskirts uh, they're independent workers these are your homeowners and people who rent rent homes and then on the outside uh, there's better residents upper middle class and then on the outskirts on the out outside these are your wealthy landowners and crime is due more to social disorganization in pathological environments than the deviant behavior of abnormal individuals. And that's a quote from Gibbons from 1979. The ecological impact of human behavior has been documented in a transitional area which exhibited very high criminal activity despite considerable change in ethnic makeup. Such areas bred criminal graphic influences and predisposed occupants to crime and social dis disorganization. So what they're saying is at a public transportation area, they're realizing that, uh, you know, this is just kind of a breeding ground for crime. No matter what kind of races or ethnicities mingled there, you know, it was just the fact of just the fact that it was a high criminal activity. Uh, the crime rate decreased the further from the central zone one people moved out. So the central central, the center center, the nucleus is zone one. And the further out the people got, uh, the safer people were. Uh, routine activity theory. There is a symbiotic relationship between legal and illegal activities. That's a quote by uh, Menser and Tardif from 1985. It specifies three earthly elements of crime. One, being a likely offender. Two, a suitable target. And three, the absence of a capable guardian, a capable guardian against crime. It considers how everyday life assembles these three elements in time and space. It shows that a proliferation of lightweight, durable goods and a dispersion of activities away from family and household could account quite well for the crime wave in the U.S. in the 1960s and 1970s. Indeed, society invites high crime rates by offering a multitude of illegal opportunities. That's from Felsen from 1978. The probability of crime varies by time, space, and social setting. An individual's lifestyle places them into societal settings with either a higher or lower probability of crime. That is from Koenig. Uh, 1991 study <clears throat> differential association theory uh, this theory states that individuals become predisposed towards criminology or crim uh, criminality by an excess of contacts that advocate criminal behavior thus uh, from high contacts the person will learn and accept the criminal values and attitudes that favor criminal criminality uh, there's this states that criminali criminality is learned. Criminal behavior is learned by repeated contact and communication. Uh, begin integrating self into criminal grounds and group thing. And they eventually adopt a systematic, uh, more advanced systematic techniques to further criminal enterprise. Uh, the social control theory addresses the issue of how society maintains or elicits uh, social control and the manner in which it obtains conformity or fails to obtain 
it in the form of deviance. Uh, containment theory. Individuals have various social controls, which are called containments, that assist them in restraining pressures that draw them towards criminality. Social forces may predispose individuals to crime, as well as for individual characteristics that may insulate them from criminal activity or propel them towards such activity. <clears throat> that comes from uh, a study from Reckless, nine, 1967. That was the sociologist's name, was Reckless. Social bond theory. Delinquency takes place when... A uh, person's bonds to society are weakened or broken, thus reducing personal stakes in conformity. <laughs> Individuals maintain conformity for fear that violations will rupture their relationship with their family, their friends, their neighbors, jobs, school, and such. In essence, individuals conform not for fear of prescribed punishment from criminal law, but rather from concern with violating their group's mores and personal image of them held by these groups and the members inside those groups. These bonds to society consist of four key components. Belief. Now, belief in the covenant-keeping Elohim Yahweh and the, con and the conventional norms and value systems and the law acts as a bond to society. Each individual has free will and individual choice enters that equation now belief according to them is the least important but according to me it is the most important because belief if you have a belief if you believe that a bridge is going to break if you have a belief that that bridge is going to break that is going to infect literally that belief is going to infect re, uh affect your reality by the way you um, operate in the physical realm because your belief that that bridge is broken is going to a either tell you <laughs> don't cross the bridge or seek an alternate route or such it's going to lead to a physical reaction also if there is no belief in a god then the <laughs> the predictability the uh, the probability of becoming deviant and stealing and breaking those commandments of moral absolutism increase 100%. <laughs> even if they have attachment, even if they have a belief, even if they don't have a belief. Um, so if they do have a belief, then it goes down because they have a holy fear of Yahweh and his commandments. So belief is very important. Belief in the covenant keeping Elohim Yahweh and in the conventional norms and in the value system and the law acts as a bond to society. Free will, individual choice enters this equation. Now attachment, attachment refers to a bond to others such as family and peers, important institutions such as family, church and schools. Weak attachment to parents and family may impair the personality, development and poor relationships with the school are viewed as instrumental and delinquent and instrumental to delinquency commitment commitment involves the degree to which an individual maintains a vested interest in social and economic system if the individual has much to lose in terms of status job or community standing they are less likely to commit or they are less likely to violate the law involvement Involvement entails engagement in the legitimate social and recreational activities that either leaves too little time to get into trouble or deters them from the desire to commit crime. Hershey, 1969. General Theory of Crime by Hershey and Gottfriedson. Low self-control in the pursuit of self-interest causes crime. Deficiencies in parenting distinguish those who express self-control would be less likely to become involved in such activity. Devel developmental and life course theories. Uh, these address three ideas. The first being the development of offending and antisocial be behavior, risk factors of delinquency or committing crime at different ages, effects of life events on 
life course development. This is a theory brought forth by David Farrington, uh, indicates that uh, the theories intend to explain crimes of theft, burglary, robbery, violence, vandalism, fraud, drug use. Uh, all of these can be applied uh, to the offending lower class urban male and western society. Offending uh, prevalence peaks between 15 and 19 years of age. Onset offending peaks between ages of 8 and 14 and distance occurs between ages 20 and 29. Early onset portends long criminal duration and commission of many crimes. There is continuity, uh, continuity in offending from childhood to adolescence to adulthood. High offenders in one period tend to be high offenders in the next. Uh, next, even though most eventually desist from the crime. Chronic offenders have an early onset, high offense, uh, high offense frequency, and long criminal careers. Offenders are versatile at crimes as well as antisocial behavior, such as bullying, truancy, and heavy drinking. Crimes in the teenage years tend to take place in groups, <clears throat> whereas offenses after the age of 20 are committed alone. Prior to age 20, revenge excitement and anger may motivate offenders after this age uh, utilitarian motives are predominant the onset of different types of un uh, offenses occur at different ages shoplifting takes places sooner than burglary which occurs, uh, occurs before robbery gang membership occurs and has its onset in the teenage years uh, desistance is the is quitting criminal Criminal activity after age of 20 is predicted by life events such as marriage, employment, military service, and better residential environments. So all of this information I got from um, Introduction to Criminology, Theories, Methods, and Criminal Behavior uh, from Frank E. Hagen. And I thought that it was important to go through and discuss some of this uh, versus uh, just because I saw that um, it ties into Ethro and the establishment of government and will give the viewer a better idea of what is a criminal justice system all of it was established by Yahweh and me personally I am a criminologist and I study uh, criminal crime and uh, criminal criminal behavior and I thought that was interesting and it ties into uh, the Torah portion and I wanted everybody to have a better idea so Shalom Shalom and Yahweh bless